Thank you. Good afternoon. In recent days, we have seen a significant increase in the number of COVID-19 cases arising from a new cluster at the Jurong Fishery Port, even as we are working to bring the KTV cluster under control. The number of unlinked community cases has also increased significantly. Unlike the earlier KTV cluster, which largely affected younger population segments, the current Jurong Fishery Port cluster is spreading among a wider segment of the population, including the elderly who are, higher, who are at highest risk should they contract the virus. It has also spread to several markets in the community, which are frequented by seniors. Seniors who are 60 and above, uh, there are about 81 seniors 60 and above were infected over the last seven days, and among them, 12 were unvaccinated. This is of great concern to us because almost 30% of the elderly population above 70 years old remain unvaccinated. Overall, close to 50% of our resident population is still not fully vaccinated and therefore not fully protected. Given the speed of infections and the rate that new clusters are growing, we will need to temporarily slow down the spread of the virus to give us time to raise the coverage of our vaccination program, especially among the older population to protect them against the infection. Therefore, we need to put in, put in place additional measures. From this Thursday until 18th of August, we will revert to phase two heightened alert. Higher risk activities which require the removal of masks, such as dining in, high intensity sports and facials will be suspended. Food and beverage outlets will remain open for delivery and takeaway services. Supermarkets and wet markets will also remain open, so there is no need to rush to stock up food or essential items during this period. We have also decided not to differentiate our measures for vaccinated people during this period given the heightened alert, but will consider doing so once we have hit higher vaccination rates or when the situation has stabilised. We know that this news is extremely disappointing and frustrating to many, in particular for businesses in sectors such as the FMB. These sectors have been very badly hit given the earlier restrictions and have been working very hard to adapt to the changing regulations. I want to thank our businesses and workers for walk walking this journey with us. We know that the last 18 months have been challenging and we will provide additional support for the affected businesses as we make this shift. Some people have also asked why we are tightening measures if we are planning to live with COVID-19 eventually and how this fits into our endemic COVID plan. Our direction has not changed. However, when we outlined our plans to live with COVID, we also emphasized that we, need, we needed to significantly raise our vaccination rate. And meanwhile, we still need to keep infection under control to protect the unvaccinated, especially the elderly. Over the next few weeks, we will make a much bigger push to get our elderly population vaccinated. I know today's announcement feels like a huge setback to many who have been observing the rules and doing whatever it takes to keep themselves and the larger population safe. We deeply appreciate your efforts. Once we have slowed down the new clusters and hit higher vaccination rates, we will be able to continue with our reopening journey. Thank you. Let me say a few words in Mandarin. 最近几天几个邻里市场出现许多年长者光顾年轻人呢有老人家也该多加防范以保他们的安全过去七天有 81名确诊者 
是六十岁或以上的，其中十二名尚未接种，所以我们我要再一次的恳请恳请尚未接种的，特别是年长者，尽早接种，以保护自己，保护家人。谢谢。I'll now invite uh, Minister uh, Ong Yikang to uh, say a few words. Thank you, Kim Yong. Today being Hari Raya Haji, let me just say a few words in Malay first. Saya dan pengurusi bersama MTF saya ingin mengucapkan Selamat Hari Raya Haji kepada semua umat Islam. Jaga diri, jaga kesihatan. Virus ini tidak mengenal masa dan tempat. Namun, kita harus bekerja sama untuk membasmi virus ini bersama. Let me now switch to English and explain a bit what is happening to the two big clusters we are dealing with, the KTV and the Jurong Fishery Port or JFP clusters. I updated the status of these two clusters in a Facebook post yesterday, so I won't repeat the facts. But in summary, <clears throat> we have formed multiple rings of surveillance and detection around both of this cluster. For KTV, 193 cases as of 19 July yesterday. This is a result of testing over 5,000 over 5,000 individuals who are exposed to the virus. The good thing is that day by day, we see the infection numbers or detection numbers decaying. And I think we will continue to see a downward trajectory. So that cluster is stabilizing. Jurong Fishery Port, as of 19 July, there are 179 cases. And it has spread very worryingly to 28 markets and food centers, every one of which have at least one case. And the numbers are still rising. Unlike the KTV cluster, we are not seeing it decaying, and the numbers are actually rising. So this is the period when we look at the cluster emerging. Every day it makes a difference. And uh, I would say the picture is now not Entirely, entirely worsening every day. It's a more mixed now. Um, for example, yesterday, we have 163 community cases. Uh, 44, only 44, or 27% of them, are isolated before detection. It's not a very high number. Today, preliminary, we are probably going to see 184 cases. We're still finalizing the number. So slightly higher than yesterday. So that's the not so good part. However, the silver lining is the momentum of increase has slowed down. Unlike yesterday and the day before, it doubled. And today increased, but the momentum has slowed down. And more importantly, today, uh, 85 or 46 percent of the cases are isolated before detection. So yesterday, 27 percent isolated before detection. Today, likely to be 46 percent. So we hope tomorrow the number go up. When you see the number go up, which means these are cases where already quarantined and isolated, they are not passing to others when they develop the symptoms. So they are much less risk. And as you see that happening, you should also see us turning the corner with the numbers coming down. Yeah, that's how the trajectory often behaves. Um, last week, when KTV cluster first broke out and MOH first learned about it and confirmed the cases, I spoke to the media immediately through a doorstop at MOH. I would say that at that point in time, when we were looking at 40, 50 cases or 60 cases a day, if we have no vaccination, I think MOH will immediately call for a circuit breaker or at least a, a phase one, phase two heightened alert and put a slam the brick straight away. But at that time, we had good vaccination rate, almost reaching 50% at that time. And then we discussed as an MTF and we assessed that we were in a much more resilient position than, than a year ago. And so our, our initial assessment is that if we quickly
quickly move in to test aggressively, draw many rings around the KTV uh, cluster. And given the fact that this is a fairly specific network of patrons and hostesses, we can contain the risk of it spilling over to the larger community. And if we can do that with aggressive testing and quarantine, we can keep it under control. Hence, at that point in time, we decided that there's no need to roll back in a big way and we calibrated to the 2-5 rule that we see today. It just started on Monday. There are two if you're unvaccinated, you can dine. Five, you are fully vaccinated. And so there was, it was assessed that there was no need for suspension of these higher risk setting activities or going back to phase two heightened alert. And we felt that so long as the cases hover around 40, 50, 60, we can maintain the posture while keeping the cluster under control. Unfortunately, every day makes a difference and public health situation have changed in a short few days. Jurong Fishery Port Cluster broke out and almost immediately we discovered cases at Hong Lim and then Chongbun uh, markets. Um, the fishery port cluster may have in fact preceded the KTV cluster. This is what MOH is, uh, one of the possible hypotheses. I will let DMS explain uh, how this may come about. Our immediate worry over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, uh, it was a nervous weekend because we knew that hundreds, over a thousand fishmongers and their assistants visited the fishery port, may be infected, and then went on to the community to sell their fishes. And because fish is in short supply, many shoppers, patrons, residents actually went and queued up for fishes. So that was a very worrying weekend. Um, we needed to prevent the spread, and therefore MOH called out for help to NEA. And NEA went out very early Sunday morning and have to do the very difficult, very unpleasant thing of telling fishmongers you can't sell today because you might expose to your patrons to the virus. So instead, we issue them a health risk warning that require them by law to get themselves tested and then isolate themselves until they get their test results. So I can imagine how hard it is for the fishmongers that morning. I can also imagine how hard it is. It was for the NEA officers having to do this, but unfortunately, we had no choice. Yeah. Um, so 1,120 fishmongers and store assistants uh, was brought for testing. I was over the weekend having a nervous weekend and hoping that few are infected. Turns out 30 out of that 1120 came back C+. Um, and so there is considerable exposure at the markets and in the community. And today we have 28 markets with at least one uh, infected resident amongst them. And hence, once that happened, we know we move on to testing wider rings of people in the community and around the market. So all the storeholders, store assistants at all the affected markets, we got them tested. We are testing them as we speak. We distributed, we are distributing self-test ART kits to the residents living in the blocks around all those markets, advise them to minimize social interactions, stay home if possible especially if they have unvaccinated seniors living with them. In this whole process, we tried to keep the industries with higher risk settings open, namely FMBs and gyms. But because of this significant shift in public health situation, the MTF needs to rethink our posture. What are our key considerations let me explain. Number one, from MOH perspective, our hospital capacity, which must be protected. Once that is under pressure or overwhelmed, um, we will have a disaster. And many people, patients, will all be affected. But as of now, as I explained in our press conference last week, we are still okay. We still have headroom. We can still rev up our capacity, which we are activating. Um, 
and we still have that headroom to, to withstand uh, the pressure. But if the cases keep on rising or keep at today's level and carry on for a couple of weeks, it can come under significant pressure. Um, we don't want to take that for granted and we need to protect our hospitals and patients even though as of now, as I explained last week, we are still in an okay position. But don't take that for granted. Second consideration is vaccination. As of end of yesterday, I'm happy to say we have crossed 50% of our population having received both doses and completed their regime, their vaccination regime. But there remains over 100,000 unvaccinated seniors over 70 years old. And if you add those that's above 60 years old, that's another 100,000 or so. There's altogether 200,000 above 60 years old. And they have a high likelihood of falling critically ill once infected. The, almost every one of them, if infected, will end up in hospital because they are high risk. And 10 to 15% of them, based on our experience, will end up in ICU. So imagine 200,000 people, if we have widespread infection, just 10% of them, let's say 10% of them get infected, that's 20,000. All 20,000 will be in hospital. Amongst them, 10 to 15%, that's two to 3,000, will end up in ICU. It's a huge, huge number. Um, the last consideration I mentioned is community ex exposure. So as I mentioned, unlike the KTV cluster, which has spread amongst younger population and amongst a certain network of people. This wave of infection affects the markets and our food centers and affects a much wider spectrum of our population, including our seniors, especially our seniors. And the porous nature of our food centers and our hawker centers also increase, uh, the increases the risk of cryptic and silent transmission that is hard to detect. Hence, after thinking long and hard, we decided we have to revert to phase two heightened alert. It is most unsettling for the affected industries and the establishments. But, you know, we are so close, weeks away, to a stage where we have two-thirds or more of our population fully vaccinated around National Day, and then being able to much more decisively transit to a COVID-resilient posture. We are so close, weeks away. And so therefore, now is really not the time to risk it all. So we need to bite this bullet, dial back on social activities, and then use this time, push through the vaccination efforts. We're now doing 80,000 a day almost, every day, with 70 to 75% dedicated to second doses, helping many more individuals complete their doses and their regime. And these few weeks, go all out, reach out to the seniors and try to vaccinate them. We have reached out to GPs for your help because we know many seniors, they're not going to listen to ministers but they may listen to their doctors and their GPs. So help us call them, persuade them that it's better for you to get vaccinated. And when we reach a much more resilient stage with a much higher percentage of our population fully vaccinated, we can then reopen industries and with the confidence that even if cases rise, to the level today, 100, 200 cases a day, or even higher, we know we can stay safe and allow businesses to continue operating and life can go on. And at that stage, we will then move on to tackle and help the sectors that actually have not even smelled any sign of recovery, and that is tourism, that is aviation. We've been talking about FMB and gyms, but these two sectors are not even smelling any recovery. But we will reach there and we'll start looking at helping those sectors recover. They have not been forgotten. 
And finally, I want to just end off thanking all the personnel working frantically but quietly behind the scenes. Who are they? Healthcare workers, COVID frontline staff, our quarantine, uh, our officers issuing quarantine orders, not easy to face families who are always in a shock. Uh, our swabbers, our armies of contact tracers, drivers, many more. Past few days, they have been working literally around the clock to contain the situation and have been put under tremendous pressure. Uh, they are really the unsung heroes behind the scenes as we speak and doing their best, hold the fort and keep Singapore safe. I will now hand over to DMS to provide more information about our clusters and the local situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Minister Ong has highlighted the rise in the number of community cases that were reported over the last few days. The cases were detected through a variety of means, including testing at SASH clinics, uh, and these were symptomatic individuals, particularly with history of visits uh, to venues where clusters have been reported. Other cases were picked up during our community testing operations for patrons of KTV outlets, visitors to the Comfort Delgro Driving Centre in Ubi, to Hong Lim Market and Food Centre, to the Jurong Fisheries Port, and fishmongers at various wet markets across the island. And where clusters of cases have been detected at specific markets, follow-on testing operations have been conducted, expanding the pool of people subjected to testing, which include other stall owners, operators, and assistants at the markets, cleaners and support staff, as well as patrons and visitors to the markets. These testing operations continue, and have been more than 3,400 persons tested, for example, for the operations at KTV clubs, more than 1,800 persons for visitors to the CDC driving centre, more than 3,100 persons at Hong Lim Market and Food Centre, more than 7,600 persons at the fisheries port and related wet market testing operations. The operations have detected at least 119 cases of COVID-19 infection so far, but the numbers will continue to increase with the updated figures from today. And they will provide you with a sense of the scale and magnitude of community testing that is ongoing. As of yesterday, there were 179 cases reported in the cluster associated with the Jurong Fishery Port and Hong Lim Market and Food Centre. And as I mentioned, this number will rise as we find more cases at these places and in the other wet markets. The phylogenetic testing that was performed on the first group of cases has identified the Delta uh, variant to be the cause of COVID-19 infections in, these in this cluster. The identified VOC, or variant of concern, has features uh, that uh, is similar uh, to what we have seen in other cases that we've picked up in imported cases from Indonesia. So we believe that COVID-19 infection in this cluster has been introduced, perhaps via a sea route, into the fishery port, likely from Indonesian or other fishing boats that have brought fish into the port. The exact mechanism of transmission from the boat to people who operate stalls in the, in the port isn't entirely clear. While there have been efforts to make the operations at the fisheries port as contactless as possible, it is very challenging to maintain safe distancing and safe management measures at the port due to the hot and humid environment and the nature of activities there. And this includes strenuous activities like carrying heavy barrels of fish and ice, and some mask off activities and close interactions likely would have taken place between people there. Formite transmission on contaminated services and at the stalls remains a strong possibility uh, for transmission. We have no evidence to suggest that transmission is occurring through contaminated fish, and we believe that the fish that we still consume and enjoy remain safe for consumption. There have been other outbreaks that have taken place in this setting overseas. All of us will remember the index case in Wuhan, China, occurring in a wet market type setting. And there have been other outbreaks in fish markets, in abattoirs, in other markets selling produce, in other countries including China, Thailand, Sri Lanka and even in Europe. They all have in common an environment where activities lead to close physical interactions between people 
and where safe management measures and mask wearing may not always be scrupulously adhered to. And this is an area where we will continue to work closely with our uh, partner se uh, sector leads to review the safe management protocols in place and uh, to review the need for routine regular testing to detect infections early in these settings and to disrupt potential chains of transmission. The phylogenetic tests also suggest that the clusters linked to the fisheries port and the wet markets may not have been due to a single point of introduction of infection. Indeed, exposure may have occurred over a period of time with multiple points of uh, injection of uh, infection. And this is because the genetic information for variants that we've identified so far uh, are not completely identical across the different cases. They do reflect a common parentage, but there are subtle differences uh, in the individual test results to suggest that uh, it's instead multiple uh, episodes of introduction having occurred. And so we are not able to determine how long these episodes of uh, introduction have occurred over and who might have been a specific super spreader leading to the larger cluster that has uh, uh, emerged uh, right now. It's also not possible for us to identify a specific case and to state that this was the case that led to transmission of infection from the boats to the fishery port and from the port to wet markets across the island. In the contact tracing that we've done, together with the epidemiological investigations to date, we have identified potential nexus of activity shared across the different clusters. So for example, there's been at least one individual who worked at the Jurong Fisheries Port who had frequented a KTV lounge within that individual's infectious period. It is, however, not possible for us to verify whether that individual did transmit any infection because the diagnostic PCR tests performed on that individual detected the presence of COVID-19 virus, but it was at a very low uh, count or in technical terms associated with a very high cycle threshold or CT value. And at such very low viral loads, we don't have sufficient virus to carry out the phylogenetic testing uh, to, to be sure. From the public health perspective, it is less important for us to confirm that link between the fisheries port and the KTV lounge. Irrespective of how transmission has taken place, there are cases and growing clusters in each setting. And the numbers of cases that we are picking up from the wet market testing continues to grow, and this remains a cause for concern. A number of these individuals are seniors, and it is not surprising, uh, given the setting in which we found them in the wet markets, as well as at the fishery port. And we do know that those who are uh, seniors have a higher risk of getting a serious infection, complications from their COVID-19 infection, as well as even dying from infection. And so for those who are currently admitted in hospital, while they remain well, have no need presently for oxygen therapy or not needing ICU care, we continue to monitor them closely because of this concern. And if you are concerned about your risk of exposure because you have been to these markets during the period of time that we are concerned about or to the fisheries port, come forward and be tested when you're invited to do so. Testing does protect you, your family, your loved ones, particularly if you have seniors at home. And if you have acute respiratory symptoms, please see your SASH GP as soon as is possible. If you've yet to be vaccinated, I will strongly encourage you to make arrangements to get vaccinated because that fully vaccinated person has better protection against the infection. So keep yourself safe so that all of us can be safe. Thank you. Lawrence. Good afternoon. Let me wish all our Muslim friends uh, Salamat Hari Raya Haji as well. Uh, in our last update, we were dealing with the KTV cluster and we highlighted then that this was a major setback to our reopening plans. Unfortunately, the situation is now more serious than we had realized then. As you have heard just now from my co-chairs and DMS, 
we are not just dealing with the KTV cluster alone, but we now also have a very large cluster from the Jurong Fishery Port, which has spilled over to many markets and food centers all over Singapore. Um, we are at a point where there is a very real risk of accelerated transmission all over the community. And the current trajectory of infection would suggest that if we were to continue with our current posture, we will see a sharp increase in infections and many people will catch the virus. While we have made good progress on vaccinations, we also know that there are still significant groups who are not vaccinated, including seniors. And therefore, we are very concerned that if they were to catch the virus, uh, many people, many of our seniors will fall sick and will become severely ill. That is our big concern. And that's why after such careful del deliberation, we've decided that uh, we have to make this preemptive tightening so that we can cut back on our overall activity levels and slow down the transmission. The objective is to buy us time so that we can vaccinate more people, especially our seniors, and also for those who have been vaccinated with their first dose to rebook their appointments and complete their vaccination regime. So we will adopt measures similar to what we had previously under phase two heightened alert. And these measures will take effect for one month from 22nd of July to 18th of August. Basically, just to summarize briefly, event and gathering sizes will reduce to 100 persons. We'll have tighter capacity limits across public venues like shopping malls and attractions. Group sizes will reduce from five to two, and we will stop all indoor mask off activities, including FMB dining and in gyms and fitness centers. These are the details, but the general message to everyone under phase two heightened alert is please stay home, minimize your movement and social interactions as much as you can. I said that we have these measures in place for a month, but we will review after two weeks and we will then consider adjustments to the measures based on the overall situation then. I fully understand that many affected businesses will feel deeply, deeply disappointed by this turn of events. Uh, many would have been looking forward earlier on to the reopening, they would have made preparations, would have started putting in place systems to differentiate their customers based on vaccination status. And I'm sure would be very disappointed to know that they now have to close and cannot allow, I cannot allow for customers to dine in, especially for our FMB operators. I hope you understand the reasons why we have to do this. And I assure you, that the government will provide a support package to all affected businesses and workers. We will take reference from what we had done earlier in phase two heightened alert, but we are still working out the details and MOF will announce this additional support package over the coming days. This has been a very difficult decision to make because as you heard from Minister Ong just now, we are so close to reaching our vaccination status. And so we deliberated over this extensively, asking ourselves whether or not it was really necessary. Uh, but based on the assessment of the way the cases have developed, the many clusters that we are seeing, and how it's likely to have transmitted through into the community, uh, we've decided that we have to put in place something to slow down the transmission. And so we do have to hunker down one more time to make sure that we get more people vaccinated and protected against the virus. So let's continue to work together, get past this bump as we have done before previously, push, push ahead with our vaccination program, and we will eventually get back on track with our reopening plans. Thank you. Thank you. Let's continue to work together to bring the situation under control. While at the same time, we need to push ahead with our vaccination program 
and hope that we, are, we will be able to achieve our, to complete our vaccination program as scheduled or earlier. And particularly among our senior population, we do want to uh, step up our efforts to reach out to them, to encourage them to come forward to get vaccinated so as to protect themselves as well as protect the community. Now I would like to invite the questions from the media. Thank you, Ministers and DMS. Dear members of the media, please remember to use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask a question and a reminder to keep to one question only and speak clearly and slowly into your mic. May we have the first question from Tim St. Thank you, Ministers and DMS. Now, we saw quite a few people online asking about returning to home-based learning or even having another circuit breaker. Given our vaccination rates at the moment, are either of these still a possibility and why or why not? Thank you. Lawrence? We continue to monitor the situation very carefully. Um, for the overall situation, based on our assessment, we think that going back to phase two heightened alert is appropriate to slow down transmission and, as I said, buy us time to push through our vaccination program. Where it comes to schools, we do have in place a whole series of very stringent protocols and safe management measures in order to minimize interactions in the classrooms and ensure that there is no transmission within the school system. And that's why, for the most part of this pandemic, we have been able to keep schools open, ensure that learning continues safely, not just for our students, but also for all our educators. And that's something that we should not take for granted because if you look around the world, uh, many places have ended up closing their schools for extended periods of time. And many studies now have shown that these extended school closures do have an impact on learning. It has an impact on students and on children which may remain with them for some time. So there may even be permanent scarring in terms of learning and human capital, which we have tried very hard to avoid. So based on the current assessment, MOE at this present stage would still keep schools open. Uh, even in the recent wave of transmission that we have seen from the KTV and the Jurong Port clusters and in the markets up to now, we have not seen any school-based transmission. So the students who have been infected got infected through family members, but not in schools. Uh, so the MOE will continue to ensure that our safe management measures in our schools are stringently upheld. They will make sure that all the protocols are adhered to strictly. And of course, they will continue to monitor the situation very closely to see if further adjustments are needed along the way. Thank you, Minister. Next question is from uh, Jing He from Taobao. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. So my question is uh, regarding how this outbreak will affect the National Day Parade activities and also just to understand how the fish port will affect the hospital capacity. How many of these cases are asymptomatic or serious from the fish port and wet market? Let me take the NDP question first. Uh, national Day is an important national event. It's a special event. It's not just any other occasion. So as of now, we do intend to continue with the National Day Parade, but MINDEF is reviewing the conduct of the parade, the scale of the parade, and all the necessary safe management measures to ensure that any rehearsal or events leading up to the parade itself can be done safely. So that's something that is being done and MINDEF will provide updates in due course. Uh, thank you very much for the question concerning uh, whether or not uh, the cases were symptomatic or not. I don't have uh, the full data at this point in time. Uh, we're still trying to work through particularly the data that's coming up from uh, the cases that uh, we're going to report uh, today. Uh, but all the cases uh, that have been reported uh, so far have either been asymptomatic, picked up through uh, the testing operations we've conducted, or with mild symptoms. And mild symptoms include fever, cough, a running nose or sore throat. Uh, none of them have had severe symptoms, 
None of them currently in the hospital require oxygen support therapy. None of them are in the ICU at this stage. Uh, so we will continue to track this, and when more detail is available, we will uh, let you know about that. If I may just add, but actually I'm adding something that uh, DMS told me earlier. Uh, one is that we now every day uh, report the number of patients that require oxygen supplementation or ICU. So the number has not gone up. ICU patient remain at one. But as DMS have reminded me several times, the onset of critical illness often happen a week or 10 days after infection. So we have to watch the number carefully. Thank you, ministers and DMS. Can we have the next question from Gwyneth of CNA? Hello, thanks for taking my question and hi, happy Hari Raya to you. Um, the next few weeks, as you mentioned, are fairly critical. It, and actually over the past few months, we've seen quite a lot of major clusters pop up now and again, and each one gets bigger and bigger. So from now for the next three, four weeks while we get a vaccination rate up, what proactive um, what proactive steps can be taken during this critical time to prevent even you know, further large clusters? Have there been any lessons? And also, why not just do a circuit breaker once and for all? Why wait for ICU beds to fill? Yeah, maybe I can take that. It's precisely because of your concern that we are now reverting back to phase two heightened alert. But I don't think going back to circuit breaker is necessary or will help. Because circuit breaker affects manufacturing, affects construction, and many other sectors of the economy, of which there are now also safety protocols, RRT is in place, Many of them are in settings where they are highly vaccinated. So they are actually in a much more resilient position. So we have never contemplated the need to go back to closing them down. It would not have been necessary. Today, the sectors affected are two groups. One, mostly FMB gyms, those with higher risk settings, that we are still not at the stage where we are, that the sectors are resilient. Uh, to COVID-19. And then the other sector that I mentioned that have not even smell recovery, aviation and tourism. So I think as our vaccination rate goes up, it is true when you are highly vaccinated, sometimes you get asymptomatic infection and you may move around passing the virus to more people. So it plus the fact that you have a Delta variant that's much more transmissible, you combine the two effects, I think is one of the reasons why you are seeing bigger clusters uh, these days. But at the same time, we are much more resilient given our vaccination rate, and this is the direction we have to keep moving. As we progress along the, this expressway, um, further down the road, you'll find that we get more and more resilient, and clusters like this will become less and less a factor in leading to industries having or sectors having to suspend their operations. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Pauling from Channel 8. Hi, Ministers. Uh, Pauling from Channel 8 News here. It's been a while since we talked about uh, getting seniors to be vaccinated, but the percentage still remains at about 30% unvaccinated as of now. So just now, Minister also mentioned that we'll be going all out in the next few weeks. So maybe you can elaborate a bit more. How, what else can we do to actually get more seniors to be vaccinated? We we'll appreciate if you can have a reply in Chinese. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can ask me in English, I will not use English. There are many ways we are doing. 好几个方面叫他们帮帮忙
，这就是我们的 Mobile Vaccination Team， 就是流动接种团队，呃，到我们的十个邻里中心去。这十个邻里中心是我们发现有最多还没有接种疫苗的年长者到那里去，所以。可能接种呃接种队伍就在你家楼下，所以非常方便，就快点下去接种疫苗。第四就是我们也有好多个团队，现在一些行动不方便的年长者可以打这个电话，我们会前来上门来，一个医生一个护士帮你接种疫苗，各种各样的方法。大家如果还有什么好的点子，请呃跟我们提议，我们会尽量接下来这几个星期尽量的去。呃，接种疫苗，保护我们的年长者。让我补充一下，我们也同时呃，带动了许多义工，包括我们的呃乐林关怀大使，到呃老人家呃跟老人家联系，跟他们的呃平常接触过的年长者联系，鼓励他们去接种，特别是那些他们知道还没有接种的呃年长者。鼓励他们去接种，也帮助他们啊、呃，带领他们到接种中心去接受接种，特别为他们安排，这些都是我们在继续努力。但是最重要的，我们也希望鼓励家人，如果你家里有老人家还没有接种的话，啊、呃，我们自己也要鼓励我们自己家里的老年人赶快去接种，这样的话能够保护他们。这样的话，因为虽然他们没有出门，但是年轻的啊、呃，还是在在外跑动工作啊。啊，读书上课啊，还是在社区里面活动，还是会把这些风险带回家里的。所以，我们希望年轻的一辈也能够尽我们的能力，鼓励我们家里的老年人呢去接受接种。我再补充一下，就是我们有时看报纸，就看到为什么美国啦、以色列啊、英国，他们可以这么干、这么样勇敢的开放，有好几个原因啦。第一个原因是他们的接种率是比我们高，第二是他们经历了好几波很大波的这个疫情散播，所以有很多他们的人民啊、国人呢、啊，虽然没有接种，但是有自然的这个抵抗力了。啊，第三就是他们在年长者接种这方面做得非常成功，百分之九十甚至百分之九十五的年长者已经接种了。所以他们有这个信心能够开放，因为他们明白、他们了解他们的年长者已经受到了保护，这个相当可取的一个经验。希望我们也能够这次接下来的几个星期也能够做得到。Thank you, ministers. The next question is from Sandra of ARD German TV and Radio. Sandra. Good afternoon. Um, you are. We uh, were mentioning that you need to convince, especially the two hundred thousand elderly who are sixty plus. What happens if you can't convince them? Let's say a hundred fifty thousand will still not be vaccinated or are not willing to be vaccinated. Do you have to reverse course? Will we not see any more opening if that happens? Maybe I'll take the question. Uh, uh, let me explain that uh, our focus next few weeks, as you mentioned, is to try to get them to be vaccinated as soon as possible and as many as possible. So I think that should be the focus of our efforts over the next uh, few weeks or even the next few months. In time to come, as we be, uh, progressively open up our economy and our community, we will introduce a differentiated uh, approach for those who are vaccinated will then be allowed to do a lot more activities because they are protected. And for those who are seniors who are not yet uh, vaccinated, including those who cannot be vaccinated, then we may have to put in additional precautions to protect them. Some of the high-risk activities may not be able to, they may not be able to participate in. The key uh, focus uh, objective is really to continue to protect them, especially those who are uh, not able to be vaccinated. So I think we will then need to ad adopt a uh, differentiated approach to differentiate those who are vaccinated against those who are non-vaccinated to provide additional precaution and protection for those that are not yet uh, vaccinated. But the focus of the, over the next few weeks really should be uh, paying attention to encouraging these seniors to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, I have a request 
to repeat what I have just said in Chinese, in English. So maybe let me do that and then also try to answer and add to the answer that Kim Yong has given. Um, the question was, how else are we reaching out to our seniors above 60 years old? So we are doing whatever we can through various measures. Number one, for some time now, vaccination centres are open to our seniors. They don't have to make a booking. They go straight in and they can get vaccinated. So many have responded to that. So that has been a very effective measure. Second is uh, DMS has called out to all our GPs and primary care providers, please reach out uh, to your customers, your patients who are above 60 years old and unvaccinated and persuade them. Because we do know for many seniors, in fact for many of us, we listen to our GPs. Uh. They are our confidant, they are our friends. They have been giving us advice since we are young. And so the GPs is a big source of influence amongst the seniors. Thirdly is um, we have all our volunteers from AIC, from our Silver Generation Office, from People's Association, going all out, uh, visiting many households with seniors, asking them if they are vaccinated and trying to persuade them. Uh, so they've been working very hard, but I think there's a limit to how much they can persuade. Fourthly is uh, MOH have also sent out uh, many teams uh, to the homes of seniors with mobility issues uh, and a doctor and a nurse will form a team and go to their homes and then deliver or administer vaccine at home. Uh, fifthly, will be our mobile vaccination teams. They are all together 10 teams. Uh, I think sometime this week they'll be out in 10 towns where we have records showing that we have the most number of unvaccinated seniors. So they will be stationed there making it even more convenient for the seniors. Uh, lastly, in my Chinese answer, I also mentioned that in certain countries like Israel, US, certain states at least, in the UK, we see that we, we may read the papers and wonder why are they so brave in, and courageous in opening up. And the reason really is one, their vaccination rate officially is higher than Singapore. Two, they have undergone waves of very traumatic transmission. So many of, their many of their population are recovered patients with natural immunity. So that adds to their vaccination rate. And lastly and very importantly, they have very high rates of vaccination amongst the seniors. Some going up to 90, 95%, which explains why they are a lot more confident in opening up their economy. And so this is also what we should work towards. Will it always hold us back? I don't think so. This is a, a path that we will continue to press on. As of now, we have about 71, 72% of seniors above 70 that are vaccinated. Those 60 to 69 is actually quite high. We are above 85%. But above 70 is where we need more work, where we have 71, 72%. But in the coming days, we will reach at least 75%, just based on bookings alone, and those that have finished first dose and coming forward to do their second dose. So we know we will have 75% in the back, but coming weeks, if we can reach out to even more, maybe we can reach 80, 85%. But at the same time, also be cognizant that as the rest of our community become more vaccinated, we are also less likely to get infected which means we are also less likely to bring the virus back home and infecting them. And plus what Kim Yong has said, we also have to implement differentiated, uh, uh, differentiated uh, treatment of public health measures so that those who are unvaccinated or have seniors who are unvaccinated at home, maybe we need to have differential uh, policies uh, so that as to protect them within the community. Thank you, Ministers. The next question is from Mayuko of Nikkei. Mayuko? Yes, hi. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I would like to ask about um, the uh, KTV lounges. Um, those who are given um, an opportunity to change their business um, pivot to be a FNB, um, and I believe um, they they aren't able to operate currently. Um, will you 
allow them to reopen or are you going to you know totally cancel this uh, scheme um, or uh, because you are uh, getting so close to reopening um, you will gradually you know um, allow them to start a business um, I, I, I believe there are nightclubs other than KTV lounges. So are they treated in the same way? Um, and if I'm- um, Sorry, Mayuko, I'm, uh, we have to cut you off there. Just <laughs> one you. question. Right. Thank okay. you. Lawrence? Well, you thank, you, thank you for the question. Indeed, our agencies, um, we impose this two week suspension on all these pivoted operators. They could be clubs, they could be um, KTV lounges, they could be bars and pubs before but all have now pivoted to F&B operations. We took a two-week suspension for the very purpose of going through in greater detail the safe management protocols that are in place, looking at the premise, looking at how it is organized, and therefore the agencies will indeed, as you had said, take a risk-based approach uh, towards these pivoted opera operations. Some of them could be in a hotel, could be in a country club, and we look at it, we see it is properly done, the protocols are in place, they are strictly complied with, then we may um, allow them to resume after two weeks. Some of them where there are more questions asked, uh, there are more questions and we ask, the agencies are not satisfied that they are able to comply strictly with the measures, we may take a bit more time. Or in some instances, in our inspections, we may already see breaches. We may already find some breaches that uh, are there. For example, CCTV is supposed to operate and we find that the CCTV is not working and we may have detect other breaches as well. And so in these inspections, if there are operators with existing breaches, we may even then revoke the license and not allow them to continue operating. So that's the risk-based approach that we will be undertaking in this two-week review. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Venga from Tamil Murasu. Venga. Hi. Uh, so I understand that there will be a support package given to affected businesses um, until 18th August. So just wanted to get an idea of um, what are the businesses that would actually uh, be getting this support package um, and you know would there be a need to sort of tap into the reserves again to fund this support package yeah thank you thank you I, as i mentioned we are going through the details now um, to give a sense of what the support package would look like um, you can just look back at what we had done previously under phase two heightened alerts uh, it's a package that works out to be somewhere in the region of 800 million plus 900 million um, previously. And so we think it, we, we will use that as a reference, but recognizing that um, you know, there are industries that have had to go through one setback after another, we may well make some adjustments to the parameters. So that's something we are studying. And we will still try our best to cover, to finance uh, the package without having to go into our past reserves. Because as I've explained before, the situation is quite different. We had to go into past reserves previously. It was an emergency situation um, and we had no choice. But under current situation where the economy is already recovering uh, and still expected to recover, but we have this setback and the restrictions have to be put in place for an extended period now, I think we will have we should try to find other ways to uh, fund the package without having to dip into past reserves. So again, we are working out what's the best way to go about doing this and we will provide an update on both these aspects, the specific items in the package and how we go about funding it in, um, in the next few days when MOF is ready to announce the details. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Kelly from the Business Times. Hi, um, thanks, Ministers and DMS for the update. Um, I want to ask, is it too early to talk now about an endemic era when we've seen how quickly the new variants um, emerge and spread? And there is a lot of uh, frustration 
um, from especially the affected businesses that we are seeing that we want to live with the virus, but we seem to be, you know, moving in and out, um, tightening and loosening restrictions within short periods of time. Thank you. I'll say something and then I'll ask uh, uh, Minister uh, Ong to add on. Uh, I think we, are, we have to plan ahead uh, for the endemic situation so that we have a clear uh, roadmap towards that direction. But as uh, Minister Ong uh, 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 said uh, during the last uh, press conference, he gave an analogy of uh, on the expressway. I think we are on the expressway towards the final objective of uh, endemic COVID. But along the way, there will be bumps. And uh, sometimes you may have roadblocks, you may have obstacles, and you may need to make a detour. But eventually, when we overcome the roadblocks, we will come back to the expressway and continue the journey. So I think these are the roadblocks that we are seeing now, every now and then. And we must be prepared to be flexible, to adjust very quickly, to respond very quickly to the evolving situation, so that we are able to continue to keep the situation under control. That will allow us to get back to the same, uh, uh, the original route uh, as soon as possible. So I think we need to continue to plan ahead for our endemic uh, 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 roadmap, but at the same time, be prepared to make adjustments along the way in response to the evolving situation. The question is, is it too early to talk about an endemic COVID or a COVID resilient economy and society? Short answer is that it is not too early because we are already in the journey. I know it may not feel like it, and we seem to move forward backward a bit, one step back, three step forward, two step back, but the fact is we are on it. And the question was raised earlier, why not do a CB like last year? But we have put that behind us because we were, we have been on this endemic journey or COVID resilient journey. And we need not look back at closing down manufacturing, closing down offices, closing down uh, construction activities. We put that behind us with, with effective measures. And today we are dealing with high-risk settings, uh, industry, F&B, gyms, fitness. And we, we, we struggle with it because our vaccination rate is not high. And we explain the reason why. In time, we are very confident. We can be in a resilient position. And we need not do this. But I bet you by then, you will continue to feel the same way. That is it too early to talk about endemic COVID? Because by then, we will be worried about tourism, aviation, sectors they are very important to Singapore and even harder to manage and to stay resilient to, uh, and, and, and help us stay resilient. So it is a journey that we are continue to prod along, but we are already on the journey. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Evgeny Soloviev from Itatas. Evgeny? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, as Minister On just said, that uh, around 50% uh, of population are already fully vaccinated. And I'd like to ask uh, why in current situation government still doesn't allow fully vaccinated person to participate in uh, high-risk activities like dining or uh, indoor sports activity. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, as we explained earlier, the considerations is that we have 50%. It is not quite high enough if you compare with US, Europe, Israel and other places where they have uh, very big waves of transmission and so they also have a percentage naturally immune plus they have much higher uh, vaccination rate among the elders. So in our case, 50% fully vaccinated or received two doses plus having 200,000 or more seniors above 60 still unvaccinated I think we still have work to do. And so while we are progressing along this journey of opening up, moving towards a state where COVID is endemic and we are resilient to it, I think as of now, and we are weeks away from achieving a very high milestone of at least two thirds having received two doses, really just literally weeks away, it is, it is really not the time to risk it all. And so I think we take this decision not lightly, but we go back to phase two heightened alert, give ourselves that time to push on with vaccination. And when we emerge from it, we'll be much more resilient. 
Can I just add that, in fact, we did consider and we were going to have vaccine differentiated, differentiation and allow fully vaccinated persons to engage more freely in some of the higher risk activities. That was the basis of the measures we announced last week. But as I mentioned just now, and as we have collectively sort of gone through the assessment of the situation, if we were to continue with those sets of measures, it is very likely that based on the force of infection that we are experiencing now, their cases will continue to rise sharply and there will be many unvaccinated persons who catch the virus and who will fall sick subsequently, especially amongst the seniors. And that's why we decided uh, better not continue with that vaccine differentiated strategy, just um, scale back, go back to phase two heightened alert temporarily, scale back activity and slow down the transmission and buy us time. Uh, avoid a situation where we have a very sharp increase in infections and then many people falling sick. And having, after we have gone through this period for the next few weeks, as I mentioned, we will review and con continue to look at the situation. And at some point in time, once the situation has stabilized, we do intend fully to continue with this strategy of vaccine differentiation, where those who are fully vaccinated will be able to engage in more activities. Perhaps uh, it may be useful to clarify that uh, the vaccine will protect you against severe outcome and protect you against some in, uh, uh, infection, will reduce the risk of being infected. But once you're infected, there is a risk of you passing on the infection to someone else, especially those who are not vaccinated. And therefore, while we are prepared to introduce differentiated approach earlier, that was because the situation was under control. We are able to be more targeted in our measures. But now that we are seeing that the number of cases are growing very quickly, that means there's a significant transmission in the, tr in the community. Even among those who are vaccinated, they do get infected and they do pass on the infection. And given the high level of, uh, still uh, a relatively high level of those who are not yet vaccinated, especially among the seniors, we need to protect them against uh, potential infection. And therefore, we will have to also put in uh, safety measures for those who are in, uh, vaccinated as well to prevent a transmission in the community, which in turn will endanger those who are not vaccinated, including those who are seniors. Thank you, ministers. We will now take the last two questions. The next question is from Hui Min from CNA. Thanks. Um, so my question is, you know, with transmissions at wet market being a big concern, is blanket closure an option that is being considered? And whether these would be extended to, you know, private markets, dry markets, supermarkets as well, because they all kind of get their fish from the same pots, right? Yeah. Well, the challenge with closure of um, markets is that if you were to close one market, there is also the risk that people may then continue with their marketing and they go out and then they will congregate and crowd in a diff another market. And if we, um, you know, if there is a cryptic transmission or a cryptic case in, another, in this other market, then the crowding of people in that particular market may spawn yet another large cluster. The, then you say, well, if, if that's the case, why not close all markets? But if we are to close all markets, again, it, you know, where will people crowd? They may crowd at supermarkets. And if they crowd at supermarkets, will cryptic transmission happen there too? So this has always been a challenge we've had with um, food as outlets, particularly markets and supermarkets, because the concern that people may have is that there is going to be a shortage and therefore I must go out and buy. And that's why we've decided we don't have to close, but what we will do is put in place safe entry controls, check-ins on across all our markets progressively that will be done. We are going to test all market stall holders to make sure that they are COVID free. And thirdly, we put out an advisory to remind everyone, please do not, there is no need to panic, go out, there's no need to go out and rush to buy groceries and food. In fact, under phase two, heightened alert, best that you stay home, minimize your movement and activity level, scale back as much as you can, 
And if we all do that, then I think we can keep things under control. Thank you, Minister. The last question is from uh, Adzi of Berita Harian. Hi, Ministers uh, and DMS. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for the Hari Raya wish on behalf of the Muslim community here. Just one question for me. Understand that the National Day is an important national event, but as we've seen last year, how large crowds still gather around the neighbourhood area, and also just last week at the Marina Bay area. So how do you guys ensure that there will be no new cluster given the already high number we are facing now and won't a new cluster further strain our healthcare system? Thank you. Thank you. That's indeed a concern that I, that I mentioned just now, that it's not just about the parade itself. Um, the parade itself, as I mentioned, MINDEF is going to review the parameters, the scale. We already look, are looking at vac only vaccinated persons who are performing as well as attending the parade. Um, but we look at the scale and the safe management measures that are needed for the parade to be conducted safely. But as you mentioned correctly, having the parade safely is one thing. But if you have the parade potentially outside of the venue itself, there may be crowding as people gather to watch things that are happening around the parade venue. And that's something that MINDEF is very mindful about. And that's why they will review the entire scheme, uh, the, the entire setting, not just the parade venue, but across all other locations around the bay and in, and in the different places that they are looking to organize uh, events or activities. And they will make sure that the new parameters, the new settings for the National Day event itself will be in accordance with safe management protocols in keeping with the spirit of the heightened alert and they will ensure that all of this can be done safely before they proceed. And as I said, MINDEF will be announcing further details in due course. 